The Wrong Reader's Guide to Cormac McCarthy All the Pretty Horses Part 1 How Cormac McCarthy Saved Civilization Chapter 1 Shit Out Loud Nine times, walking in the rain across the wide green Greenvale campus of Long Island University, I said shit out loud. The rain was fine, so was the walk past the environmental sculptures, the riding stables for posting horse girls, the bridal paths, the deserted playing fields, all of which were mine alone. But I was upset. Shit. Sobbing as I walked, saying shit was more than seepage of angst from under the tears. Tears both release and multiply emotion. Tears spoken are no longer tears. That is one step beyond. As we know from Hamlet and All the Pretty Horses, when a man soliloquizes, it means much. Shit. A word, not a monologue, but it was full. One letter can be full. When I use the word O in my work, I have to caution copy editors to keep it a single letter, not O with an H, for I have encountered that O in Shakespeare, and it does whatever he and you as an actor need it to do, and it can last for seconds. Shit. That can last for days, weeks, years. Shit. It was all McCarthy's fault. Cannot something be done about this man and his work? I had cheated on a self-assignment to coldly review the first few pages of All the Pretty Horses. Recklessly, I had read through to John Grady Cole with his dying old man over lunch in the Coke County town of Robert Lee, population under 2,000. Ten pages previous, the boy out grazing the grady pastures in hard rain in his late old granddad's slicker set me sobbing even then, and that reminded me of another noble John, Johnny Depp, walking to the Edson Cemetery off Gorm Street in Lowell, Massachusetts, with yet another John, John Sampas, Jack Kerouac's brother-in-law, and a black check raincoat that Sampas had loaned him and that had belonged to Kerouac, in the pockets of which Depp found Kleenex and a jackbook of matches. I thought of Grandfather Grady's seasoned leather satchel that hitches with the kid to San Antonio, and the fact that I never had a thing from my grandfather, excepting, of course, my father and myself, because I never had a grandfather, but... Like John Grady, my father was a gambler. He was an outlaw bookmaker for most of the time that I knew him, and all that I have of him is an old Ronson lighter and cigarette case that still has strands from his last Benson and Hedges. All the pretty horses sat me again at my father's desk after he had died, looking at and into it, and really all over the house he had abandoned in debt and without the means to keep it at one point trying on his glasses, realizing belatedly that my father had had only one eye. Hey, Ma, how come Dad's glasses? The other had been lost to a darning needle at Mott and Mulberry Streets in old little Italy, Scorsese territory, when it looked like the streets in The Godfather too. But none of my own old family crap was making me say shit nine times in the rain. The instigators were on page 24, two sentences to which I should never have strayed and ought not in the future be permitted to stray again. His father stirred his coffee a long time. There was nothing to stir because he drank it black. How did Cormac McCarthy save civilization? I'll tell you exactly how with words like that inching across pages like that, with a belief in what it is to be a magician, with a renaissance devotion to the bardic enterprise, bearing it in true faith and allegiance without reservation or purpose of evasion, or ever a true sleep, 
with a standard of literacy that, in these ever-darkening days, constitutes an underground religion, a revolution of one, asserted in arms against an indifferent status quo, a contagion of misrule on the body politic. During the twelfth century, a rival clan drove the McCarthys out of Tipperary. No one drives this McCarthy out of his scriptorium, and the labors of which he has no rival or peer, only the blessings of those who appreciate the author's improbable enterprise, one that summons no children to its flag. In a slender blue gem of a book that no one has heard of, Shallow Water Dictionary, John Stilgo wonders whether what he calls estuary English is the gentle echo of older speech or the raw edge of a new tongue. I am tempted to see McCarthy in both of these, the gentle echo of older speech, the raw edge of a new tongue. But I hasten to contradict myself. New tongue? No, nowhere, not unless it is McCarthy's next novel. Am I investing too much in a matter of style? As C.S. Lewis says in an addendum to the screw tape letters, at bottom, every ideal of style dictates not only how we should say things, but what sorts of things we may say. Of course, I am aware that the out on a limbness of my appeal invites dismissal, and when I am dead, I'll be sorry that I went too far. But one cannot pre-apologize for one's hyperbole, and in fact, what resembles lack of restraint, such as the title of this section, is only a citizen artist pushing a man of letters toward celebrations of genius that are equally skirmishes in the fight for truth, justice, and the American way. And... For what Carl Ziegrosser, in a charmer of a 54-page book called Multum in Parvo, calls insight with a gasp. At a time like this, when you look out the window to see dictionaries dying in the street, when you drive by landfills of lost alliterations, bohemian manifestos, beat beatitudes, and secular graduals whose chants of the infidels have all been displaced by the songs of the executioner. When you look up at the sky, see the most brilliant versicles flashing out forever. When you spill out sentences that make no sound because they have evaporated before they reach the ground. When your friends come to call bearing books for the garden and none of them will grow. When gray-locked Melville who felt that there was a good deal lacking to the plump sphericality of Hawthorne, and said that he needs roast beef, done rare, would sample our Stockholm prizes and wonder whether their substance had dissolved in invisible ink, when every broke-back flatbed is bundled with the charred remains of one more lost Alexandria, when you shudder to think that Marshall's epigram, They praise good books, they read the bad ones, is truer now than two thousand years ago. At a time like this, I say, McCarthy is more than a great writer. He is a language. Why? Because he is the language. He is the book of the book, the village of the book, the people of the book, brooding the book in a camp for fugitive word hordes on the outskirts of town.